Hi everybody. So in this video, I'm going to be looking at the sample thesis outline planner for the summary response uh, paper. I have done it on an article that is in your book in the past. So this is just an example to see how if I were reading an article, I might approach the summary response task um, and the planner specifically. So the article I am doing is trial lawyers cater to jurors demand for visual evidence. That's on page 528 to 531 of your book. Um, I believe you can just Google that as well. Uh, I know some students in the past have found it online. So you don't have to read this article. It's just a reference point if you wanted to go back and look and see where some of these ideas are coming from. So for the first section, ideas for the attention grabber slash hook, this is your chance to get your reader interested in the topic. You might include a quote from the article, a hypothetical scenario, or an anecdote. Um, if you go back and look at the parts of an essay PowerPoint, there is a slide on hooks um, that gives some advice on how to create a hook to get people interested. Um, so an appeal to pathos, uh, the appeal to emotion, whatever will get your reader interested in reading about this particular take on the topic in your article. In this case, um, for the lawyers catered to jurors demand demand for visual evidence, I might try and look through the article for a surprising statistic and pull that out and say like, did you know um, something along those lines? Background context, here you're gonna provide some background or context about the topic. Um, so you're looking for one to two sentences that just explain what the topic and the context is. So you might wanna explain why this is a discussion that's going on or um, like where the discussion started or how the discussion started. What is the context for the conversation that's being had about the topic you chose? Um, so, and that's just going to be in one to two sentences because you really are going to get more into your specific article in the summary, but it's just a way to include sort of like some context for the conversation that's occurring. So when we're looking at this, this background context, um, I, in my example, could explain that more jurors are demanding visual evidence, or I could talk about how lawyers are using visual evidence more frequently in court trials now, just so people understand the basic premise of um, the topic I'm talking about. Uh, this just one to two sentences. Um, for the thesis statement. Okay, so here's my thesis statement, and you can see that I've color coded it. I'm going to come back to that. We're going to skip that. The thesis statement is actually something I want you guys to write last. So we're just going to skip right past it, and I'll show you why. The summary. So you can see that I've kind of given like an idea here of how I would break down this particular article. So if you want to go back and look at the article, this is one way of doing it. Um, think about being an organized critical thinker. So if you're supposed to break down the main points of an entire article, how are you going to do it? Um, one way is to look back at the subheadings. Uh, if your article has subheadings, look back at the subheadings and say, okay, well, there's three sections in this paper, so clearly I should probably read each of those three sections and include a statement about each one of those sections, a sentence summing up each one of those sections. Sometimes that's not so easy <laughs> because we read articles that are broken up into many, many sections, or we read interviews that have lots and lots of questions, um, or we read papers that have no subheadings at all and are just a bunch of paragraphs. In that case, it's still the same task. Go through and break it down section by section and paragraph by paragraph and look to see what the main point in each of those sections is and then figure out how you can generalize and sum that up. For all of you, the articles you read, you should not be writing a summary really that's more than five sentences long, even though your article might be much longer. Um, you should be summing it up in about five sentences because the point of a summary is to have a condensed version of all of the major points. So one way I always think about summary is think about it like it's a report. If you listen to a reporter talk about something that happened, like let's say a reporter's reporting on a fire, they're going to give you the details of when it occurred, where it occurred, maybe how it occurred, who it impacted, but they're not going to give a play-by-play -play of like at 145, the first firefighter showed up. Then at 146, the hose was taken off the truck. They're not going to give every single minor detail. Um, they're going to report on the major ideas, the major important takeaways. So that's what you want to do in a summary. Um, and keep focusing back on what the other person said. 
So when you summarize, you don't want to include your own opinion. Um, it's like a good critical thinking practice to also force yourself to say like, okay, well, what is this person really saying before you have a chance to respond further down in the paragraph? So the summary is a really good way of putting yourself in a more objective listening mindset. So the first sentence is always going to include rhetorical information, the author, the title, the year, the source, plus the main idea. So in every single one of your opening summary sentences, you want something like, in the 2014 article, I don't remember when this article was written, uh, trial lawyers cater to jurors' demand for visual evidence. The author, and I believe her name was Sylvia Say, um, explains blah, 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 blah. So you, uh, the, then the blah, 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 blah is the main idea. Remember that the main idea is the topic plus what the author wants to say about it. Topic plus what the author wants to say about it. Here, I just broke it down specifically for that article. So if you want to see how I approached it, um, I summarized, I planned to summarize the entry par introductory paragraph in a sentence. And then there were two sections in the article I looked at. Every case can be visual was one subheading and evidentiary challenges was another subheading. So I set myself the challenge of summarizing that entire section into a sentence and summarizing the evidentiary challenges section into a single sentence. And then I summarize the concluding paragraph. Don't forget the, to summarize the conclusion because that gives your summary a really clear um, ending so that we get a, an idea of the whole article. Um, okay, and the so then what I did is you can see here in green, in blue, and in purple, I have those three reactions I talked about in the video last time. I read the video, I thought about what I wanted to say in response to this article, and these were the three observations that I had. My first observation um, was that I thought the visual evidence in some of the trials where I had been a juror would have been more interesting if we had had, um, if we had had visuals to look at. Um, and this is a lie. I was not actually selected for jury duty, so I don't know. But <laughs> this is just me giving like an example of something that you could say. Um, because many of you have been jurors. So I think that visual evidence in some of the trials where I have been a juror would have made the cases easier to understand and more interesting. Okay, so you can see that I used the language of I think, I agree, and I think in these topic sentences, because I'm really trying to force myself into this sentence to show my opinion. That's one way that I'm gonna avoid getting caught in that trap of just repeating what the article says. So I don't wanna just say the article says it's gonna be easier to understand and more interesting because that's summary. I want to make this about my observations and my thoughts on the actual article. So here you can see, uh, personally, I think the visual evidence in some of the trials where I've been a juror would have made the cases easier to understand and more interesting. Okay. What I'm doing right here, this is reflection. This is how what the article is saying ties back personally to me. And the second main point that I want to make is that um, the uh, that too much visual evidence can be distracting or cause the jurors to lose interest. What I'm doing here is I'm agreeing with the author's belief. The author says that too much visual evidence can be distracting and can cause the jurors to lose interest. And I am agreeing with that idea. Notice how I'm not saying like, I agree that um, there's a lot more visual evidence in trials now, because that's not something to really agree or disagree. It can be proven or disproven. I'm picking out something, an opinion of the authors, and I'm going to either agree or disagree with it. So this is an example of an ideological response. Again, you do not have to identify what type of way you are responding. You just need to know that these are some options of what you can do. And I, and I did it here. If you look at the third one, finally, I think the author provides excellent support for the idea that visual evidence can be manipulative. That is a rhetorical critique. So you can see that what I've done here is a blend ideological, reflective, rhetorical. It doesn't matter to me how, like which way you choose to respond just so long as you have one clear response per paragraph and you bear it out with examples from the text. So here um, you can see what I'm, what I'm critiquing is that the author rhetorically does a good job. The author does a good job um, 
supporting the idea that visual evidence can be manipulative. And if I go back to the text, I'll probably include an example of cases um, that had visuals that were misleading. There's a couple anecdotes in this article about that. I only filled out one of the examples details explanations because I just wanted to give you an idea of what I'm looking for in these. And you can see that I added one here. Um, there weren't four to begin with. Sometimes I might have two, sometimes I might have five. It depends on how much evidence you're gathering for the particular um, idea that you're putting forward. So in this topic sentence, I say that evidence can be distracting or cause the jurors to lose interest. All of the points I'm going to put under here are going to be support for that idea. I'm not going to get into manipulation because that's for my next paragraph. I'm not going to get into whether or not it would be, it's more interesting because that's my first paragraph. Here I'm saying, I agree with the author's belief that too much visual evidence can be distracting or cause the jurors to lose interest. Okay, so that's what I'm going to prove. This is my opinion. The author warns that it is important to keep videos relevant. Well, it's not really my opinion. That's just the case. <laughs> Even jurors can tell if it's unnecessary to turn a piece of testimony into a video for no reason. Um, and then here's my support from the text, which you guys are going to want. The author says, if everything is turned to video, jurors will soon tire of it. So here the author is really, this is where I'm like, here's specifically what the author says. Um, I've got as my in-text citation, these words appear exactly, um, I should do this. these words appear exactly like this in the text of the paper. Oh, I should actually, never mind. So I'm quoting the text. I put it in quotation marks. And then after I include a citation, this is what the citation should look like. Author last name, publication year, and the page number where I found it. Jurors will get tired of video the same way they were tired of listening to talking for hours. So here I have this fourth point because I want to conclude with my actual um, thought. I don't want to just end on the quote of somebody else. So that's something to keep in mind. When you're writing, you want to close your paragraphs out on your thoughts, not on the author's thoughts. So always kind of reflect and conclude with your own opinion and thought to back up your uh, and support what you're claiming. Then down here under reworded thesis, I didn't put anything. You guys know now that the conclusion, hopefully I said this to everybody, but I'll say it, I'll say it to everybody again. The conclusion should end up being three sentences at least because a paragraph should typically be about three sentences. So that's the conclusion. Um, so you guys will conclude and kind of, I would prefer if you put the three sentences in just to see like how you're going to make that conclusion three sentences long. So you can do more than just the reworded thesis. And then the last thing I'm going to do is now, believe it or not, I'm going to write my thesis statement. Because when you write a summary response paper, you just come up with all of the different responses. Let's say I went to write this paper and I'm like, oh man, this is like half a page too short. I can always add in that fourth main point, that fourth main point that was um, an option on your planner because I could, I could come up with another separate observation. Maybe I don't like the way the article concludes. When you are doing this kind of responding, you can keep adding in observations. Um, you just write a separate paragraph for each observation with evidence relating back to that observation. So when I look up here at the thesis statement, um, what I've done is I've just put those together and you can see that I've color coded it. Though visual evidence can make a case more accessible and interesting, easier to understand and more interesting. I agree with the author that it needs to be used judiciously and carefully to avoid overstimulation, overstimulation, and manipulation. Manipulation. So you can see that I have taken the ideas and put them together in this way. And so um, one thing that I'm going to work with you guys with, but you can be thinking about ahead of time, is that this is actually not the order that I thought of these observations, but it is the order that I put them in to make the most sense. You can see that they go, when I cover them in the thesis statement, it goes green, blue, purple, and then I cover it green, blue, purple. I put these things like this very specifically because at first I talk about something that's good and then I focus on the things that are maybe not so great. So that was a conscious choice about like how you might want to organize. Like if you're like, well, I like this, but I don't like this, consider organizing those things together. So that's a little bit about the thesis outline planner.